They call themselves Neo-Reaganites, but were willing to answer to Neo-Conservatives or Hawks. Paul Wolfowitz was generally considered the brains of the outfit. Paul Wolfowitz believed then that it was a mistake uh, to end the war as we did under the circumstances that we did. They underestimated uh, the way in which Saddam was able to cling to power and the means he would use to remain in power. That was the mistake. One of the most controversial assertions made in The Israel Lobby and Foreign Policy by John Mersheimer and Stephen Walt is that members of the lobby played a principal and necessary role in the plan to invade Iraq in 2003. Without them, they argue, the invasion would not have happened. As Stephen Walt wrote years after the book was published in Foreign Affairs, even some readers who were generally sympathetic to our overall position found that claim hard to accept. And some left-wing critics accused us of letting Bush and Cheney off the hook or of ignoring the importance of other interests, especially oil. Rather than oil, the pair contend, it was a powerful group within the Israel lobby, the driving force of America's hawkish interventionism and proponents of spreading democracy by the barrel of the gun. Or here's a less graceful description from prominent neoconservative Michael Ledeen of the American Enterprise Institute. Every 10 years or so, the United States needs to pick up a small, crappy little country and throw it against the wall just to show we mean business. Ledeen was at one time a consultant to the U.S. National Security Council. Norman Finkelstein, a key critic of Israel today, as they carry out a genocide in the Gaza Strip, was, at the time of the book's publishing, openly at odds with Mersheimer and Walt over this very issue. The argument that Steve Walt and I make in our book is that the Israel lobby, again, mainly the neoconservatives, were the principal driving force in the United States behind the war in Iraq. Now, we argue that the lobby by itself, or the neoconservatives by themselves, couldn't make the war happen. They definitely needed President Bush and Vice President Cheney to be on board, and that happened after September 11th. I, uh, I do not think the evidence supports that claim. The chief architects of the war were Mr. Rumsfeld and Mr. Cheney, and I doubt anyone would claim that Mr. Cheney or Mr. Rumsfeld have any allegiances other than to the U.S. government. Not satisfied with merely debating Mersheimer, Finkelstein devoted a chapter in his Knowing Too Much to the Iraq Question, where he gives a brief but helpful history of the neoconservatives. The founding fathers of neoconservatism, such as Irving Kristol, he has been called the godfather of neoconservatives, rode the Marxist wave in the 1930s. Irving Kristol, Norman Podhoritz, Midge Dechter, the magazines around which they coalesced were basically partisan review and commentary. When this wave crested after World War II, they joined in the liberal anti-communist witch hunt of the 1950s. The neoconservatives then rode the new left wave in the early 1960s. When it crested in the mid-1960s, they again joined in the establishment backlash to it. As the spectrum of respectable opinion in the U.S. shifted steadily rightward, the Jewish neoconservatives galloped yet more swiftly, eventually crossing the Rubicon from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. As Finkelstein writes, the collapse of the Soviet Union shifted the focus of the neoconservatives, and indeed U.S. defense policymakers generally, on the Middle East. However, he staunchly disagreed on a key argument put forth in the Israel lobby. The most sensational item on Mersheimer and Walt's charge sheet alleges that the disastrous decision of the Bush administration to invade Iraq in 2003 was orchestrated by the Israel lobby. Finkelstein argues that if the principal architects of the war, namely George Bush, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld, were motivated by Israel, why in the first and second-hand accounts of the pre-war behind-the-scenes debates of the Bush administration, Israel barely gets a passing mention? 
Finkelstein looks to their memoirs. In her memoir, No Higher Honor, Condoleezza Rice, who was National Security Advisor in the Bush administration, does not list or even allude to Israeli security as the, or even a, motive behind the attack. In his memoir, Known and Unknown, Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense in the Bush administration, also does not list or even allude to Israeli security as the, or even a, motive behind the attack. In his memoir, In My Time, Dick Cheney, who was vice president in the Bush administration, also does not list or even allude to Israeli security as the, or even a, motive behind the attack. If the Israel lobby played such a critical role in the decision to attack Iraq, how was it able to so effectively cover its tracks? One could understand why Cheney et al. might want to conceal that oil was the impetus behind the attack, but it is unclear what motive they would have to conceal the Israel lobby's role. It's a good question. If Israel played an important role in the decision to invade Iraq, one would think that this would be mentioned in the various memoirs of the perpetrators. In Mersheimer and Walt's book, they quote, knowledgeable and well-respected individuals who had said openly that the war was linked with Israel's security, beginning with a Philip Zelikow. In September of 2002, Zelikow was a member of the president's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, known to insiders as PIFIAB. He would also serve as executive director of the 9-11 Commission and as counselor to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. They've also written at least two books together. His words before an audience at the University of Virginia on September 10, 2002, were first reported by Imad McKay of the Interpress Service in 2004. While speaking on a panel of foreign policy experts, Zelikow said the following statements. The unstated threat, and here I criticize the Bush administration a little, because the argument that they make over and over again is that this is about a threat to the United States. And then everybody says, show me an imminent threat from Iraq to America. Show me, why would Iraq attack America or use nuclear weapons against us? So I'll tell you what I think the real threat is. It actually has been since 1990. It's the threat against Israel. And this is the threat that dare not speak its name because the Europeans don't care deeply about that threat, I will tell you frankly. And the American government doesn't want to lean too hard on it rhetorically because it's not a popular sell. Zelikow names a familiar foe. If the danger is a biological weapon handed to Hamas, then what's the American alternative then? Play out those scenarios. Don't look at the ties between Iraq and al-Qaeda. But then ask yourself the question, gee, is Iraq tied to Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad? and the people who carry out suicide bombings in Israel? Easy question to answer, and the evidence is abundant. Zelikow was right. In an October 2002 Human Rights Watch report on Palestinian suicide bombings during the Second Intifada, they note that Saddam Hussein's government provides funds to families of martyrs and others and has established a differential in which families of suicide bombing operatives are said to receive a considerably larger sum of $25,000, while other families that have suffered a death receive $10,000. Iraq provides these monies through the local Ba'ath Party-affiliated Arab Liberation Front, or ALF. The ALF is a constituent member of the Palestine Liberation Organization. They cite an informative article from the Sydney Morning Herald. Its author, Paul McHugh, interviewed the Arab Liberation Front's Secretary General, Raket Salem, who confirmed that since late 2000, more than 800 families have received martyr payments of $10,000. It's transferred by the banks, he said, from the Iraqi banks to the banks in Palestine. Philip Zelikow was not happy with Mersheimer and Walt publishing his quote in the original article which later became the book. In the end notes of the subsequent book, Mersheimer and Walt write, We used these quotations in our original article in the London Review of Books, and Zelikow challenged our interpretation of them. We based our discussion on a full and unimpeachable record of his remarks, and his challenge has no basis in fact. Ironically, Zelikow appears to have been proving the point made in his original speech. As we saw earlier, 
Finkelstein's skepticism of Mersheimer Walt's argument includes the fact that there is no mention of Israel as a motivation for invading Iraq in the memoirs of Condoleezza Rice, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and others. But should that not itself elicit pause and skepticism? In his Decision Points, George W. Bush recalls a meeting with British Premier Tony Blair in April of 2002. In April 2002, Tony and Sherry visited Laura and me in Crawford. Tony and I talked about coercive diplomacy as a way to address the threat from Iraq. Tony suggested that we seek a UN Security Council resolution that presented Saddam with a clear ultimatum. Allow weapons inspectors back into Iraq or face serious consequences. As I recall that discussion, it was less to do with specifics about what we were going to do on Iraq or indeed the Middle East because the Israel issue was a big, big issue at the time. In fact, I think I remember actually there may have been conversations that we had even with, with Israelis, the two of us, whilst we were there. So that was a major part of all this. But the principal part of my um, conversation, we've got to deal with the various different dimensions of this whole issue. As we can clearly see, Blair provides details peculiarly absent from Bush's telling. Bush also railed against his critics in his memoir, saying some alleged that America's real intent was to control Iraq's oil or satisfy Israel. Those theories were false. I was sending our troops into combat to protect the American people. Saying Saddam refused to cooperate with weapons inspectors, even with the threat of an invasion on his doorstep. The only logical conclusion was that he was hiding WMD. Despite an October 2003 Congressional Research Service report, which noted that from late November 2002 to March 2003, UN inspectors combed Iraq looking for weapons of mass destruction, conducting over 750 inspections at 550 sites. There's also the findings of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's report on Iraq WMD, published in 2004. One of the committee's members, the late Dianne Feinstein, stated in no uncertain terms the state of Iraq's so-called nuclear program in the lead-up to the invasion. I think it is clear that there was not an ongoing nuclear program. In August of 2002, prior to the vote in the Senate on the authorization to go to war, I spent a day in Vienna at the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IAEA is the agency that runs nuclear inspections. They saw no signs of a nuclear program in Iraq. The IAEA convinced me that there was no ongoing nuclear program in Iraq. The intelligence reporting on a possible Iraqi nuclear program did not have an impact on me because I did not believe it was correct. Though she still voted for the war, oddly enough. The reason for the Bush administration's quietness about the role of Israel in the planning is evidenced by a revealing article in the Jewish Forward newspaper. The article is absent from both its English language and Yiddish language archives. It took some serious digging to find, actually, oddly enough, though Internet Archive finally came through with the right maneuvering. It's called Iraqi Move Puts Israel in Lonely U.S. Corner. And it was written by Mark Perlman for the week of September 20th, 2002 edition. In contrast to Bush's memoir alleging Saddam refused to cooperate with weapons inspectors, with the only logical conclusion being Saddam possessed WMD, Saddam Hussein's surprise acceptance of unconditional United Nations weapons inspections put Israel in the hot seat this week, forcing it into the open as the only nation actively supporting the Bush administration's goal of Iraqi regime change. Israel's diffident stance appeared untenable this week after most capitals welcomed the Iraqi announcement Monday that it would accept the return of weapons inspectors without conditions. Further, Perlman writes, Israel and its supporters have insisted for weeks that while they sympathize with the administration's hardline stance toward Baghdad, they were reluctant to advocate any position openly. The reluctance was fueled by fears that critics would claim the United States was going to war on Israel's behalf, or even, as some have suggested, at Israel's behest. These concerns came a month after Prime Minister Ariel Sharon told the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee that Iraq is the greatest danger facing Israel. Though he clarified, we aren't intervening in U.S. decisions, 
but he said that strategic coordination between Israel and the U.S. has reached unprecedented dimensions. Days later, Aluf Ben reported for Haaretz, Israel is pressing the United States not to defer action aimed at toppling Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq. Quoting Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, the problem today is not if, but when. Adding that while attacking now would be quite dangerous, postponing it would be more dangerous. Aluf Ben continues, but like Sharon, Perez also added a disclaimer, saying he did not want to be seen as urging the United States to act and that America should act according to its own judgment. Israel, he said, will be a good soldier in the camp led by President George W. Bush. The appetite for war among Israeli officials was on open display. Former Prime Ministers Ehud Barak and Benjamin Netanyahu wrote op-eds urging invasion. Barak wrote for the New York Times an article titled Taking Apart Iraq's Nuclear Threat. Those who prefer to wait and hope for the best should contemplate the following. No one really knows how close Saddam Hussein is to building a crude nuclear device, and it was a crude device that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Few will doubt Mr. Hussein's readiness to use a nuclear weapon against American assets or against Israel, if only under extreme circumstances. Once Iraq becomes a nuclear power, the very decision to go to war against it would become a totally different ballgame. Notably, Barack felt comfortable enough to reveal his battle plan, which involved deploying some 300,000 American soldiers. For a successful invasion of Iraq, Two operational options are basically valid, a surgical operation to hit the core of the regime and a full-scale operation to include major airborne and ground forces, perhaps 300,000 soldiers. Saddam Hussein has set an example of defiance, especially against the first President Bush, that other Arab leaders cannot and should not emulate. Netanyahu wrote for The Wall Street Journal, most Americans understand that, had al-Qaeda possessed an atomic device last September, the city of New York would not exist today. They realized that last week we could have grieved not for thousands of dead, but for millions. This is a dictator who is rapidly expanding his arsenal of biological and chemical weapons, who has used these weapons of mass destruction against his subjects and his neighbors, and who is feverishly trying to acquire nuclear weapons. We now know that had the democracies taken preemptive action to bring down Hitler's regime in the 1930s, the worst horrors in history could have been avoided. Today, nothing less than dismantling his regime will do. I write this as a citizen of the country that is most endangered by a preemptive strike. For in the last gasps of his dying regime, Saddam may well attempt to launch his remaining missiles with their biological and chemical warheads at the Jewish state. We support this American action even though we stand on the front lines while others criticize it as they sit comfortably on the sidelines. This hawkish rhetoric reportedly gave rise to concern among Israeli officials, writes Dan Eisenberg for the Jerusalem Post. In an article absent from its online archive, which I had to access via ProQuest, since it has not been archived in the Wayback Machine, the date was March 10th, 2003. The U.S. attack on Iraq will begin next week, but Channel One reported that the foreign ministry is receiving reports from the U.S. that the plethora of war predictions emanating from Israeli leaders is being sharply criticized by the U.S. media, which accused them of trying to goad the administration into war. Until now, however, Israeli officials have continuously ignored warnings from U.S. and Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to be cautious and stop predicting when the war will begin. Sharon himself appeared to heed the warning, and the man who previously claimed Saddam was the greatest threat to Israel praised President Bush today for his pursuit of a possible war in Iraq while seeking to disavow any Israeli involvement, writes James Bennett for the New York Times. The finely calibrated statement reflected concerns at the top of the government that many of the worst critics in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere were identifying Israel as an instigator. Mr. Sharon sought to split Israel's support for a war from any responsibility for it. I wish to emphasize we are not involved in this war, Mr. Sharon said in a meeting of his party, Likud, 
Looking past an Iraq war, the defense minister, Shal Mofaz, has urged the United States to prepare to put diplomatic and economic pressures on Iran. More on that later. Indeed, not just Israeli officials were concerned, but also pro-Israel lobbyists in the United States. Dana Milbank, writing for the Washington Post, reported in November 2002 that a group of U.S. political consultants has sent pro-Israel leaders a memo urging them to keep quiet while the Bush administration pursues a possible war with Iraq. The six-page memo was sent by the Israel Project, a group funded by American Jewish organizations and individual donors. Let American politicians fight it out on the floor of Congress and in the media, the memo said. If your goal is regime change, you must be more careful with your language because of the potential backlash. You do not want Americans to believe that the war on Iraq is being waged to protect Israel rather than to protect America. And it was this pro-Israel lobby in the United States that sought to tone down language implicating itself in the war which it had persuaded the Bush administration to pursue. At least that's how Mersheimer and Walt would put it. The driving force behind the Iraq war was a small band of neoconservatives who had long favored the energetic use of American power to reshape critical areas of the world. They had advocated toppling Saddam since the mid-1990s and believed this step would benefit the United States and Israel alike. It was the pro-Israel Thomas Friedman who told Haaretz's Ari Shavit in April 2003, I could give you the names of 25 people, all of whom are at this moment within a five-block radius of this office, they were in Washington, D.C. at the time, who, if you had exiled them to a desert island a year and a half ago, the Iraq War would not have happened. They were all affiliated with more than one think tank, comprising a network of like-minded fellows and scholars who would come to hold prominent positions in the Bush administration and have an influential role in American foreign policy. John Bolton, who would serve as the ambassador to the United Nations, could boast being a scholar for the Project for the New American Century, the American Enterprise Institute, and the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, whose advisory board also included former CIA Director James Woolsey and even Dick Cheney. What the late William R. Polk once described as an affinity bordering on patriotism to Israel among the neoconservatives is by no stretch of the imagination limited to Jews. In fact, Bolton is so pro-Israel that in May 2006, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations Dan Gillerman joked Bolton was a secret member of Israel's own team at the United Nations. The secret is out. We really are not just five diplomats. We are at least six, including John Bolton. After Bolton was to be reappointed in late 2006, which caused controversy among Democrats and Republicans alike, one of his defenders included Malcolm Honlein, vice president of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. We talked about them in my last video. The Conference of Presidents comprises the 50 largest organizations in the American Israel lobby. The Jewish community remained supportive and would want to see Bolton stay, Honlein said. Mark Perlman, writing for The Forward, explains, Bolton is viewed as a strong supporter of Israel and exercised the American veto last week on a UN Security Council resolution condemning the killing of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Bolton had cultivated especially close personal bonds over the years with all major Jewish groups. Just how much power did the neoconservatives have in the Bush administration? Mersheimer and Walt explain. Prominent officials in the Bush administration included Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Fife the number two and three civilians in the Pentagon, Richard Pearl, Kenneth Edelman, and James Woolsey, members of the influential Defense Policy Board, Scooter Libby, the Vice President's Chief of Staff and National Security Advisor, John Bolton, Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, and his Special Assistant, David Wormser, and Elliot Abrams, who is in charge of Middle East policy at the National Security Council. Mr. Wolfowitz, considered a leader of the neoconservatives, has an informative history prior to his being appointed as Deputy Secretary of Defense. Joseph Cirincioni wrote for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace just one day before the U.S. would invade Iraq on the 19th of March, 2003. Long before September 11th, before the first inspections in Iraq had started, a small group of influential officials and experts in Washington were calling for regime change in Iraq. 
Some never wanted to end the 1991 war. Many are now administration officials. Their organization, dedication, and brilliance offer much to admire, even for those who disagree with the policies they advocate. Cirincioni's history begins as early as 1992. Paul Wolfowitz, then Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, supervised the drafting of the Defense Policy Guidance Document. A partially redacted version of the document is available in the National Security Archive. A section titled Middle East and Southwest Asia reads, As demonstrated by Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, it remains fundamentally important to prevent a hegemon or alignment of powers from dominating the region. We must endeavor to curb proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, as well as ballistic and cruise missiles. The infusion of new and improved conventional arms and the proliferation of ballistic missiles and weapons of mass destruction during the past decade have dramatically increased offensive capabilities and the risk of future wars throughout the region. Excerpts from the document were subsequently leaked to the New York Times, which caused something of a scandal. Embarrassed, the first Bush administration retracted it. Its drafting had been supervised by Paul D. Wolfowitz, the Pentagon's undersecretary for policy, wrote Patrick Tyler, who goes on to explain the strong emphasis elsewhere in the document and in other Pentagon planning on using military force, if necessary, to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction in such countries as North Korea, Iraq, some of the successor republics to the Soviet Union, and in Europe. Though it was retracted, its supervisor, of course, became Deputy Secretary of Defense, and thus the Defense Policy Guidance document was rehashed as the National Security Strategy of 2002. Nations that depend on international stability must help prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction. We are menaced less by fleets and armies than by catastrophic technologies in the hands of the embittered few. We must defeat these threats to our nation, allies, and friends. The U.S. national security strategy will be based on a distinctly American internationalism that reflects the union of our values and our national interests. Our comprehensive strategy to combat WMD includes proactive counterproliferation efforts. We must deter and defend against the threat before it is unleashed. There's also the year 1996, when Richard Pearl, Douglas Fife, and David Wormser, all future Bush administration officials, wrote a report which they sent to the new Likud government in Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu's first term as prime minister. The report called for a so-called clean break and called removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. Jumping two years ahead, in 1998, 18 neoconservatives wrote a letter to President Clinton urging him to aim, above all, at the removal of Saddam Hussein's regime from power. That now needs to become the aim of American foreign policy. Again, many, most in this case, of the signatories became officials in the Bush administration, including Elliot Abrams, Richard Armitage, John Bolton, Paula Dobriansky, Richard Pearl, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz. In January of 2001, as George W. Bush was to be sworn in as the 43rd president, the Jerusalem Post's Washington correspondent, Janine Zakaria, reported on the emerging group of officials who will steer U.S.-Israel relations during the next four years. She declared Iraqi President Saddam Hussein is quietly developing weapons of mass destruction. Regarding Paul Wolfowitz's appointment as number two at the Pentagon, pro-Israel communities are jumping for joy. Wolfowitz is considered a strong supporter of Israel. He has been one of the loudest proponents of a tough policy toward Iraq, focused on finding a way to bring down Saddam Hussein's regime. Jumping for joy indeed. In fact, for his role in the Iraq invasion, the Jerusalem Post would name Wolfowitz Man of the Year. No question, this was Paul Wolfowitz's year. On September 15, 2001, at a meeting in Camp David, he advised President George W. Bush to skip Kabul and train American guns on Baghdad. In the process, Wolfowitz became the most influential U.S. Deputy Defense Secretary ever. Can you so much as name anyone else who held the post? The war in Iraq had many authors. Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Tony Blair, George Bush. What's not in dispute 
is that Wolfowitz is the principal author of the doctrine of preemption, which framed the war in Iraq and which, when it comes to it, will underpin U.S. action against other rogue states. Following September 11th, many people grasped intuitively that it was useless to contain or deter foes for whom suicide was an acceptable option. The difference with Wolfowitz is that he's been talking about this since at least 1992. When President Bush says, America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons, that's Wolfowitz talking. The neoconservatives had infiltrated the White House. In April of 2002, a number of them would sign yet another letter urging invasion, signed most prominently by now Defense Policy Advisory Committee Chairman Richard Pearl. Only the United States has the power and influence to provide meaningful assistance to our besieged ally. Mr. President, we urge you to accelerate plans for removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq. As you have said, Every day that Saddam Hussein remains in power brings closer the day when terrorists will not just have airplanes with which to attack us, but chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons as well. It is now common knowledge that Saddam, along with Iran, is a funder and supporter of terrorism against Israel. Iraq has harbored terrorists such as Abu Nidal in the past, and it maintains links to the Al-Qaeda network. If we do not move against Saddam Hussein and his regime, the damage our Israeli friends and we have suffered until now may someday appear but a prelude to much greater horrors. Now, I want to go back to Janine Zakaria's article for the Jerusalem Post when she reported on the new appointees in the incoming Bush administration. There's one part that will surely stick out to some of you. It's about Bush's powerful vice president, Dick Cheney. Cheney is considered such a key player on foreign policy that people in Washington have started to refer to his staff as a shadow National Security Council. And while because of his business background, he is routinely referred to as an oil man by people in the pro-Israel community, a moniker which translate roughly as not sympathetic to Israel. I think you could make a case that on September 10th, 2001, it, it's not clear that George W. Bush was in any fundamental way going in our direction on foreign policy. That's Bill Kristol, co-founder of the Project for the New American Century, and son of Irving Kristol, mentioned earlier by Finkelstein as a founding father of neoconservatism. In fact, fellow neoconservative Jonah Goldberg described Kristol as the godfather of neoconservatism. Uh, Bill Kristol also signed the 1998 letter to President Clinton urging Saddam Hussein's removal, and years later the 2002 letter urging Saddam Hussein's removal. Sorry, just so we're clear, he is one of the most prominent neoconservatives. I will work hard to find political so solutions that allow an orderly and timely withdrawal from places like Kosovo and Bosnia. We will encourage our allies to take a broader role. We will not be hasty, but we will not be permanent peacekeepers, dividing warring parties. And if you read Condi Rice's article in Foreign Affairs in 1999 or 2000, uh, and she was clearly the, the main advisor to Governor Bush, um, she was skeptical about a lot of these uh, claims that the U.S. really had to shape a new world order, or that we had to engage in nation building. That article was Campaign 2000, Promoting the National Interest, published January 1st, 2000. From a section titled Coping with Rogue Regimes, Saddam Hussein's regime is isolated, his conventional military power has been severely weakened. The first line of defense should be a clear and classical statement of deterrence. If they do acquire WMD, their weapons will be unusable because any attempt to use them will bring national obliteration. Uh, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. The neoconservatives' role in persuading key Bush administration officials such as Cheney, Bush, and Condoleezza Rice to invade Iraq are all the more apparent by the fact that prior to September the 11th, there was no such commitment among them. Only nine days after the 9-11 attacks, the New York Times reported a split over the scope of retaliation. Some senior administration officials, led by Paul D. Wolfowitz, Deputy Secretary of Defense, and I. Lewis Libby, Chief of Staff to Vice President Dick Cheney, are pressing for the earliest and broadest military campaign against not only the Osama bin Laden network in Afghanistan, 
but also against other suspected terrorist bases in Iraq and in Lebanon's Beka region. These officials are seeking to include Iraq on the target list with the aim of toppling President Saddam Hussein, a step long advocated by conservatives who support Mr. Bush. A number of conservatives circulated a new letter today calling on the president to make a determined effort to remove Saddam Hussein from power, even if he cannot be linked to the terrorists who struck New York and Washington last week. On Sunday, Vice President Dick Cheney seemed to ally himself with Secretary Powell's view when he said in a televised interview that the administration did not have evidence linking Saddam Hussein to last week's attacks. But Mr. Wolfowitz, the Pentagon's influential deputy secretary, is a conservative thinker who has frequently clashed with Secretary Powell and the State Department. He has continued to press for a military campaign against Iraq that would not only punish Mr. Hussein for his past support for terrorism at home and abroad, but would also eliminate the danger he poses to Israel and the West in his quest to acquire weapons of mass destruction. What went into flipping Vice President Cheney, now considered one of the chief architects of the war? Mersheimer and Walt looked to his chief of staff. A key part of the public relations campaign to win support for invading Iraq was the manipulation of intelligence information in order to make Saddam look like an imminent threat. Scooter Libby was an important player in this endeavor. One need only look at the Plame affair to see the quality of this intelligence, the sludge which sloshed around Washington in the lead-up to the war. Much has been said about the Camp David meeting just days after 9-11, the story of Paul Wolfowitz and his obsession with Iraq, which perhaps planted the first seeds in convincing the administration to topple Saddam Hussein. But aside from Wolfowitz, another powerful figure was a critical mastermind that has escaped the same level of notoriety. His name is Irv Lewis Libby, known by his nickname Scooter. Max Frankel of the New York Times called him a poobah courtier who knew virtually all government secrets worth knowing. Bob Woodward explains his influence in his investigative account of the planning for the Iraq invasion. He was one of the most important players in the Bush national security apparatus. Libby had three formal titles. He was chief of staff to Vice President Cheney, he was also national security advisor to the vice president, and he was finally an assistant to President Bush. It was a trifecta of positions probably never held before by a single person. Just days after the American invasion of Iraq, Seymour Hersh had written for The New Yorker, Last September 24th, the argument that Iraq had a nuclear program underway was buttressed by a new and striking fact. The CIA had recently received intelligence showing that between 1999 and 2001, Iraq had attempted to buy 500 tons of uranium oxide from Niger, one of the world's largest producers, known as Yellow Cake. Two weeks later, the resolution passed overwhelmingly, giving the president a congressional mandate for a military assault on Iraq. A former high-level intelligence official told me that the information on Niger was judged serious enough to include in the president's daily brief, known as the PDB, one of the most sensitive intelligence documents in the American system. On March 7th, Mohamed Al-Baradi, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, told the UN Security Council that the documents involving the Niger-Iraq uranium sales were fakes. The problems were glaring. One letter, dated October 10, 2000, was signed with the name of Elele Habibu, a Niger Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation who had been out of office since 1989. The attack was well underway by May 6, 2003, when Nicholas Kristof wrote of the so far missing WMD. There are indications that the U.S. government souped up intelligence, leaned on spooks to change their conclusions, and concealed contrary information to deceive people at home and around the world. I'm told by a person involved in the Niger caper, that more than a year ago, the vice president's office asked for an investigation of the uranium deal. So a former U.S. ambassador to Africa was dispatched to Niger. In February 2002, according to someone present at the meetings, that envoy reported to the CIA and State Department that the information was unequivocally wrong and that the document had been forged. This unnamed former U.S. ambassador was a Joseph C. Wilson. He had been ambo in Gabon and Sao Tome as well as head of African affairs at Bill Clinton's National Security Council. As Max Frankel explains in the New York Times, 
Wilson's conclusions and other findings persuaded the CIA's director, George Tenet, to remove any mention of uranium sales from a presidential speech in October 2002. But the Niger scare resurfaced three months later, becoming a notorious 16 words. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. The war that ensued can't be described with mere words. It was much like the current genocide in Gaza, a punishment campaign which, for grueling decade after decade, killed perhaps one million people. Not just from aerial bombardment, but again, like Gaza now, a collapse of the healthcare industry, which gave rise to waves of mass death. And Iraq was only supposed to be the first step in a larger plan. A reshaping of the entire Middle East, and with outlets currently trying to tie the Hamas incursion into Gaza on October 7th to Iran, we very well may be seeing some seeds being planted. I think we should contemplate some kind of military reaction. I'm not suggesting World War III. I'm not suggesting sending 100,000 Marines, but there are plenty of Iranian targets. I hope I'm wrong. As I've said before, the Israel lobby is a series and attention should be given to the ambitions of the Israel lobby on a nation of 90 million people just to Iraq's east. With the rising popularity of the neoconservatives yet again, Live from New York, it's Saturday night! Perhaps Iran is more deserving of attention than ever. That's for the next one. The insiders who help define the Bush doctrine are determined to set a course that will remake America's role in the world. They believe the removal of Saddam Hussein is the first and necessary act of that new era. And that fateful decision to take the nation to war now rests with the President of the United States.